every person is so unique in this world. And if you believe that there's something that needs to be addressed, you should just go for it. And it doesn't really matter that, you know, you don't need to check all of these like very specific boxes that the internet may, may tell you you need to check in order to succeed. Um, if you believe that something is valuable, I think honestly, anyone should just like go for what they think is important and just, I think the only thing that founders really need, in my opinion, is enough optimism about what they're doing to be able to persist because things take way longer than you think they will, pretty much across the board. I experienced this when I was at Protocol Labs and I'm experiencing it now with, with my new company, but it's so rewarding and so worth it. And as long as you don't give up, something amazing will come from it, even if it's just like learnings or just like an, an incredible opportunity to build a team of people that you really enjoy working with, but it'll be worth it. So. I would say people should just go for it. <laughs> All right. And with that very inspiring advice from Pooja, we are going to get right into today. Great. Welcome to Lab Day in June, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining today. And for those who are new, again, this is a monthly meetup of PLN network members and friends of PL to learn about what's going on around the network, get updates, and learn about, you know, important problems that people are working on across different teams. We meet on the third Wednesday of every month for 30 minutes at 4 p.m. UTC, and we also have IRL dinners in cities all across the globe that are open to all members. Um, for those who are here today, this is a great place to, again, get updates, celebrate wins, and learn about tools that could help your team. And for those who are presenting, it's a really great way to get in front of a very qualified group of Web3 and Web2 companies, get feedback and learnings from your presentation. And like I mentioned, these are all of the uh, cities we have IRL dinners. If you're interested, reach out to the captains in PL Network IO slash directory, and we can drop this list of cities into the chat as well. Uh, quick recap before we get into it. Um, the Protocol Labs Network is a community of teams that drive breakthroughs in computing to push humanity forward. Uh, members contribute time or equity towards uh, important projects in computing and as a result are able to get help and resources on how to grow their company. There are a ton of teams in the network. This is just a small snapshot of them. And if you'd like to learn more, look, uh, you can scan the QR code right here and check out the PLM portal. So something a little different this month that we're going to try uh, up next is a segment we're calling Around the Network, where we want to feature wins and announcements from different teams. Please let us know your feedback on this at the end of the call. Um, we uh, always love to hear thoughts and incorporate them into next iterations for Lab Day. And so first up, I want to give a huge congratulations to Artisan. They recently closed a 2.2 million round to help creators in the art, sciences, technology, uh, frontier of design, fun new projects. And so here to tell us a little bit more is Renee. Renee, are you there? If not, I guess I can steal his thunder. Um, they recently, yesterday, just announced a funding match program with the network goods team at Protocol Labs. And what that means is uh, for their next season, any teams that are focused on public goods funding can also be eligible from funding from the, uh, Protocol Labs, as well as the votes that they receive from season three. Uh, season three is closing on July 1st. So if you have a project in public goods, in uh, science, technology that you'd like to fund, learn more about it here. And to see what's been submitted and support a project, you can vote on the link here. Um, we'll be dropping these links into the chat as well. So thank you so much. Moving on to next is Filecoin Green. Uh, they are working with 
over 400 Filecoin miner IDs to validate energy use and become certifiably green storage providers. Some of the largest ones in the network like Descent, SXX, and Picnic have already completed this validation process. They've been awarded respectively gold, bronze, and silver tier sustainability claims. It's really great to see the network uh, continuing to scale responsibly and staying green. So great job to these storage providers, as well as the Filecoin Green team for providing this platform uh, that we can use to continue to monitor our progress. Uh, if you'd like to check it out, you can follow the link that we'll drop into the chat here and look at which storage providers are, how storage providers are doing on their sustainability claims. Uh, another congratulations goes out to Dummy. Uh, they recently completed a $3.4 million seed round to build out their platform that allows you to use AI and generate video shorts. And so if you think you spend a lot more time editing video shorts than you would like, you can use their promo code PLN uh, for the win, PLNFTW. Uh, to skip the wait list, which is currently at 20,000, um, and get onboarded to check out uh, this new tool. Uh, next up, Zone, is, we're diving into a huge success in the metaverse now. Zone is a music tech startup that has partnered with Universal Music and an indie pop band called Easy Life to turn Easy Life's latest album into an immersive fan experience where you can go and complete daily challenges, collect um, different memorabilia from the band and really explore a different way to be a fan and learn more about um, these artists. And so to learn exactly how they did it through uh, a custom music accelerator program, and what is next for the Zone team, you can check out this link that we'll drop into the chat here. And finally, I'm sure if you've been following crypto news, there's been a lot of discussion around how to scale on Ethereum with layer twos. That has also been a very big point of discussion for the Filecoin network. And here is Marco to tell us a little bit more about uh, the upcoming IPC deployment to mainnet. They recently just completed the deployment to SpaceNet testnet and are gearing up soon. Uh, so Marco, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Denise. So uh, we have been developing interplanetary consensus, well, building, building consensus lab team and developing interplanetary consensus lab the last year. And this culminated late last year where we launched uh, SpaceNet. So what is SpaceNet? SpaceNet is, is now our testnet that basically since November runs what uh, will look like as a, an IPC subnet. So this is a efficient low latency consensus, which looks like Tendermin, but it's more efficient because it has multiple leaders. And basically the key feature of uh, IPC on Filecoin mainnet will be that you will be able to permissionlessly spawn subnets on demand. So unlike, for example, in Avalanche ecosystem where you need to you know, set up with uh, uh, basically a permission way uh, different submits. This will be totally on demand and on fly spawning of submits, which will be powered by uh, efficient consensus, which is all a tender mean, but we that we develop uh, based on a uh, Lotus code base. So this is a consensus protocol called Mir and Trantor. And then, uh, so we started in November, 2022 when we launched SpaceNet and then we added this ability to spawn uh, subnets on SpaceNet in April, 2023. Uh, we were dependent on FEM because like we want uh, this permissionless without any upgrades to the Filecoin mainnet. So basically uh, we just now completed uh, with the external dev shop uh, uh, building of solidity actors, which will govern. So we have two main solidity actors on the, on the Filecoin mainnet, which govern the spawning of subnets. And we completed this and we will have the functional uh, demo or in July on mainnet. So there is a disclaimer. So this is not still for locking significant, significant value, but we are getting there. And this will be the mark the first uh, milestone where we will be able to launch efficient uh, submit and help scale uh, Filecoin basically starting from July. 
If you want to learn more, go, go to consensuslab.world and ipc.space, which is the landing page for IPC project, and also go to Filecoin Slack, uh, IPC Dev, IPC Help, and IPC Docs channels, uh, subscribe to them, and uh, get in touch. There is also documentation, so you can all, all, already try this on SpaceNet in a permissionless way. You don't have to ask us to set up anything. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you, Marco. Yeah. Um, deploying anything onto mainnet is definitely nerve wracking. So uh, really excited to see how you guys move forward on this. Um, cool. Uh, it looks like Renee, you uh, were able to join us. Let me get back to uh, your slide here. Do you have yeah, any apologies for that? Share? I uh, had to log into a different Zoom account. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we, we partnered with uh, Funding the Commons, which is the amazing event that Protocol Labs kicked off a couple years ago and now is being run by uh, David and his team. And uh, we partnered with them to launch a match fund for public goods. So if uh, anyone on the call uh, is working on a project that needs um, uh, you know, some uh, additional funding, not a huge amount, uh, $20,000, um, please submit. I'm going to throw a link into the chat log. Um, or if you know any creators that are working on public goods and need that sort of like five to $20,000 uh, amount of money to, to push their project forward, please encourage them to submit as well. Um, and again, I'll throw that into the chat log. Awesome. Thanks, Renee. And it's great to see. Yeah, absolutely. Expanding, yeah. Expanding beyond just the arts into technology and public goods as well. Super exciting. Yeah, it's a big, big push for us. We, so Artisan is not just for artists, even though that's what's in the title of our company name. We, we really do want to support coders and scientists and people creating anything in the very broad category of human creativity. Awesome. All right, that wraps up our Around the Network section. Moving on now to Lightning Talks and kicking it off with uh, Hannah telling us about Lassie from Bedrock. Lassie is a new IPFS retrieval client, and because it's so good at finding and fetching your data, it's been lovingly named after the famous Kali. So Hannah's here now to tell us more about how Holly, how Lassie does this and what this means for, for the uh, retrieval market space. So Hannah, over to you. Cool. Um, yeah, so... so um, uh... Lassie is indeed a new uh, IPFS retrieval client. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is, why we built it, and where we're going with it. Um, so um, let's make sure this is, there we go. Yeah. All right. So <laughs> fun fact, uh, Lassie is actually uh, a, a, almost a full IPFS implementation um, written in Go, like, uh, like Kubo is um, the most well-known IPFS implementation. But um, where Kubo is like a, a full big deployment um, with lots of bells and whistles, it's kind of sometimes called the Swiss Army knife tool. Um, Lasty, it was built essentially like a scalpel. We started with uh, essentially we wanted to build a tool that could get your data on IPFS and Filecoin networks without you having to think about it. Um, we found that a lot of the tools out there, um, they work. Uh, but you have to understand them and it's kind of a process and, you know, like uh, you have to know a fair amount about like the underlying technology to really make them work officially. So with Lassie, we wanted it to be a sort of set and forget. If you want your data, just tell Lassie to fetch it. Um, and so what is that, what, what do we have to do to get there? Um, one of the, the, the first things we wanted to take away in using Lassie is worrying about what data transfer protocol you're using. Um, as IPFS networks have grown, um, there's been a proliferation of transfer protocols. Um, I don't even know who in this call knows all of them, uh, but you, you're forgiven for not knowing them because for most people, they don't care about protocols, right? Um, they just want their data back. And uh, protocols only matter in so much as the data comes back fast. Um, so Lassie sort of approach is uh, we're, we're going to know how to talk to all the protocols. Um, we already support uh, BitSwap, we support uh, which is the primary IFFS transfer protocol. We support Hold on, I'm having a little trouble. Oh, oh, there we go, all of it. Uh, we support uh, GrassSync uh, and we support HTTP. Actually, this uh, this presentation I gave once before, and at that time, HTTP was in development, but it is now shipped 
um, we actually speak an HTTP gateway protocol to um, a number of backend providers, including um, folks like the dot storage sites, nft.storage and web3.storage and soon to storage providers as well. Um, uh, we maybe in the future will, you know, implement some of the other uh, transfer protocols that are being developed around the network. Um, Bow uh, in the IRA space uh, for the IRA implementation. Um, Vision also has a, a, a protocol called Carpool Car Sync. These are all super cool technologies, and I'm sure any of you who are not in the weeds of it don't care one bit because all you want to do is get your data, and we want to get it for you, so you don't have to think about it. <laughs> um, so uh, the other part about this is that. Most people, when they want their data, they don't want to have to worry about where to find it. Uh, where to find your data is not something that like most people, when they're used to using the web, um, have to think too much about because the tools are really good. Um, in Lassie, we want to find your data for you, and this should be it shouldn't matter um, whether it's on IPFS or Filecoin. This has been an ongoing thing, right? So we can find content in the IPFS DHT um, and uh, we can find uh, content on the Filecoin network. We even have some other weird methods like BitSwap, uh, like finding things through BitSwap peers. Um, uh, there are maybe other things we do. We're going to, you don't have to tell us where to get your data, we're gonna find it. Um, and, uh, the, and, and we do most of this through uh, the network indexer. Um, we work with their team to really build that out, um, and we can we can keep adding more ways to find data as time goes on. So yeah, I'm having a little bit of trouble advancing the slides. Let's see if we can get it to go one more time. No, okay, we are not. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Wait, all right, there we go. Yes. So uh, how do you use Lassie? Um, from the start, we've designed it with three four use cases. Um, the first is to use it um, from the command line. You can, uh, if you open your terminal, you install Lassie, you can, um, you can download it already compiled and ready to go. We don't want you to have to install Go or any other dev tools. Um, uh, and it's designed, uh, and you can essentially run fetch. Um, and it's designed um, like other Unix commands to be typeable and composable. I'll show you how that works in a moment. Um, the second way to use Lassie is a lightweight HTTP gateway to IPFS and Filecoin. Um, basically, we have a little server that exposes an HTTP gateway interface to serve car files. Um, Lassie, um, well, yeah, and, and that fits the latest version of the HTTP trustless gateway spec that has been in development. And we've actually drove a number of uh, sort of improvements and new features through the process of developing Lassie. Um, finally, um, we designed Lassie to work as a code library um, that you can put into your Go application. Um, we want developers to be able to use Lassie um, to add retrieval to IPFS and Filecoin to their uh, to their projects and not have this um, be like a, a big endeavor. Um, we're already seeing this start to, to start to emerge. We see this as a long term superpower. We would love to partner with your team um, if you want to integrate Lassie into your code base. So. Um, there's a few things that Lassie won't do, and this is specifically because we want to make keep the purpose really focused and keep it lightweight. Um, uh, our goal is to retrieve data. There's features that are left out. We do not actually hold a permanent data store uh, on your machine. Um, we fetch things and give them back to you as car files. Um, and this is important because uh, it just limits a lot of complexity um, and enables us to focus just on retrieval. Um, and that also means uh, because we are not holding data, we are not providing records back to the DHT. Again, we're a retrieval client, not a server. Um, uh, yeah, so Lassie is not a server implementation. We think design constraints are good. Um, um, and we think this is useful. Interesting fun fact, there is an in-development companion to Lassie that is just a server. Um, uh, to stay tuned. Um, uh, we think it's important to stay, fo stay focused and this, is, this enables us to do cool stuff. Okay, we're gonna watch Lassie do stuff. Here we are, we're fetching stuff. We're putting in our command line, we're fetching. We put in a, a content and we're gonna extract it and play it. And because you can pipe it, directly from a car to the go car tool and then to FF play FFmpeg we are actually downloading and playing a video automatically from the command line all right sorry that was very fast I did not mean to skip right into that slide so quickly but I guess my presentation is skipping around so much so you can see what we did there is we actually put in a lassie fetch we piped the output to extract it from the go with the go car tool and then we piped the output again into the ffmpeg player and it opens up a video um there are a lot of other cool things you can do lassie's production ready 
Uh, we are already using it to download almost all the content on the Saturn network. Um, and uh, we're getting, we're downloading 140 million savings per week uh, with it. So I think it's actually ready to be used in your programs. We think we're going to hit 1.0 soon. Um, there's a lot of other cool, here's a bunch of links. I'm not going to go through all of these um, because uh, they are, um, because you can't get to them anyway from the presentation. But if you look at the presentation afterwards, you can see this, where we are going. Um, we're already seeing Lassie start to show up in places. Lassie is now integrated into Station. Um, the, uh, the deployment that allows people to run Filecoin retrieval checks directly from uh, their own machines that are in Filecoin doing that. Um, and we are deploying it into a number of other things right now. It is a tool that is designed to go everywhere. Yes, I love it. Um, we'd love to integrate Lassie into Spice XYZ. This is what I love. Okay, cool. Um, you can you can go to all these links or hit me up on Filecoin Slack, and I would love to chat with you if you want to integrate it into your program. Cool. Sorry for the long presentation. Thank you so much, Hannah. And if anyone has more questions, feel free to drop them into the chat for her. We will be moving on to uh, Jake from Third Web, who's here to talk to us about the challenges of building in Web3, how Third Web plans to solve that, and also what he would like to see builders you know, be able to focus on once they don't have to worry so much about infrastructure. So Jake, over to you. Hey everyone, I'm Jake, uh, CTO, co-founder of Third Web. Um, since we have like a few minutes here, really just kind of want to dive into, you know, the challenges that um, comes in building the Web3 space. Um, I'm sure we have all heard the phrase of, hey, we're still early. Um, how early is early? You know, um, when will we get past that, right? Uh, before I answer that, I think uh, it's important for, for us to take a look at that from a builder's perspective. Like, how can we as a builder help users realize the value in order to then, you know, onboard more users to believe in the technology and, and see why it's important for them and why it matters for them, right? I do believe that we all here because we believe and excited about the tech and the value that Web3 provides, uh, the decentralization, trustless system, permissionless system uh, for different use cases. And I think it's our job as a builder in space to help people see that, right? But here comes the problem. Um, as a builder myself, you know, when I try to build application in the Web3 world, um, any decentralized app, very quickly I'll run the roadblocks, right? Here are the problems. It's really hard for builders to build in the Web3 space. So if it is hard to build real use cases, how can we onboard more people to realize and see the value of what Web3 could do? And let's unpack that a little bit. You know, I still remember when I first came into, you know, building in the Web3 space. Um, one of the challenges I run into was, you know, there was a lot of information being thrown at me. Um, I came in, I was like, oh, I'm excited to build a decentralized internet app. Uh, I was trying to build, a, you know, um, a card system, like using NFT and whatnot. But then very quickly, you know, I had to learn Solidity. I had to learn what an RPC was, what an ABI was, and then private keys. And so like, there are a lot of different tools and a lot of different term technology that's been created in the space so that, you know, every builder that come into the Web3 space, when they're trying to build, they have to learn all of it from zero, right? All of the knowledge I had in the Web2 role was thrown out the window, didn't matter at all. I had to relearn everything in the Web3 way and figuring out, like, you know, the, the, the nuances and the complexity of each of the tools. And that also kind of led to a second problem was tools fragmentation. Um, I'm pretty sure, you know, we all have experienced this. Uh, when you're building an application, you generally probably need to sign up for like 5, 10, 15 different services because they all do one specific thing. Oh, you're trying to talk to a blockchain? Cool. You need an RPC provider to help you with that. And then you're slowly going down the, the rabbit hole by figuring out, oh, what about this blockchain? What about that blockchain? And so over time, you know, you just have to like figure out and navigating through all of those things. And then next thing, you have your NFT store on the IPFS network or a Filecoin even. Um, well, you need a way to fetch those data. You need a way to make sure that, you know, the NFT that, you know, you uploaded being stored in a permanent storage and not temporary, right? Who wants to like wake up next day and NFT data is gone, right? Like, and that's terrible. And so there are a lot of like, just like very basic things in the Web2 world. Um, they're not re they're not really basic in the Web3 world, um, just because of like the, the technology and, and kind of the way that we, as an industry really thought, kind of 
tell the story, I, I guess, and really kind of focusing on the wrong thing, focus too much on the technology, but not really on the product. And as a builder that kind of knew the space, then it would be hard for them to really know, you know, um, what's the best way to do things. And when you're, when you're gluing all different tools together, when one of them start to break, well, good luck. You know, you better hope that they have a good support channel that can help you with it because, you know, different providers, like five different services have five different SLA agreements. Uh, they have five different supports and different pricing plan. And you have to figure out all of that. So not only you have to figure out what to build, you have to figure out how to make it happen. And you have to figure out making sure you make the right decision um, when you're picking a tools. And then you have to figure out how to integrate and pull all of them together um, all by yourself. And uh, maybe through YouTube or, or some internet search. Uh, but it's really hard for you as a developer or a builder to kind of know all of that up front. And all of that led to a long build cycle too, right? A, a regular product cycle is usually go from like, it usually goes from development to deployment to post deployment. And all along the way, you know, you have to learn specific tools, you have to learn how to set it up, you have to learn like, you know, five to 10 different new ones, like decision that you have to make to get past each of the stages. And so this is going back to like, hey, when you're building a product, why should you spend so much time worrying about the tooling, worrying about like, you know, making sure you do things correctly? Um, where's, where are the guardrails, right? Like who should be the one to kind of help you set things up? In, in the web tool world, it's very straightforward. If you want to build a website, you can just do it in two seconds. And you, you know, create React app, you deploy it on yourself. Uh, but in the Web3 world, there's nothing equivalent. There's nothing similar. Um, and if you look at kind of Web2, you know, a lot of tools help you take care of development, deployment, and the management of it, right? Even analytics, like post-deployment. Um, in the Web3 world, there's nothing similar. There's nothing equivalent. And I would say the last challenge, the, one of the most frustrating ones for me personally was uh, keeping up with the industry. <laughs> uh, you know, like Web3 is a very fast-paced industry. Um, we all heard, of, you know, people would kind of throw around like, you know, one one month in the Web3 space is equivalent like one year in the real world, right? At this point, I don't even know like how many years I'm in into this, but um, like the sense of time is, is different. And what does it mean? That, that means that like a lot of information that you kind of picked up from the internet, they will get outdated really quickly. You know, the best way to do things or the best standard to follow today could be the best today. But tomorrow it could be completely different. Why? Because the tech is still new. Everyone's still figuring out. Everyone's still navigating through all of it. And so we are all learning at the same time. And it makes it harder for you to have to build and then also have to keep up with the industry. You know, everyone has 24 hours in a day. How much time are you going to spend on each of them? It's really important for us to kind of allocate the time effective, efficiently to focus on the thing that we want to build. And, you know, standard change, best practices still being established, you know, as a building space, you kind of have to keep up with that. And all of those, you know, makes it really hard for developers or builders to come into the Web3 space and build any decentralized internet products. When you tell people you're building in Web3 space, you know, what it really means is that you're figuring out what is the Web3 space. You're figuring out what's the best practices, the tools, the tech, the regulations, and all of that. On top of that, you're building a real product that what people want. Right, you're taking a two full time job at the same time, and it's a very different story when you're building a web two space where you know a lot of the infrastructure or basic needs being those are being taken care of, and what it means is you, know, you as a builder is only focus on the product, right? Um, and that I would say like kind of some of the challenges that I felt I felt in a web three space. I believe we can do better. Obviously, that's why I'm here. Um, and you know, for us at Third Web, we take a look at that and we said that that obviously is a problem, right? Um, and we built their web because we believe that it should be easier, obviously. And, you know, the way that we have set it up is, you know, their web is the complete Web3 development framework. Everything you need to build a Web3 app, a decentralized internet product, in a box. We have SDK to help you build uh, in multiple different platforms and languages. Um, so if you want to build a Web3 game, we have a Unity SDK to help you communicate with the blockchain, communicate to the decentralized storage network help you take care of, you know, um, um, like wallet issues and all of those things. Uh, we are com comprehensive, a complete web to remote framework. If you need a smart contract, uh, we have pre-built smart contract for you to use. And we also have, you know, different like, you know, UX enhancement um, 
features like you know gasless or you know fiat on fiat to crypto on ram and all of that. And one of the the reason why we're all excited about Web3 is obviously kind of the permissionless, trustlessness nature of it. And we want to be the same way. So we have made it so that our product, our SD, are permissionless and they are completely owned by you and there is no vendor locked in. And so, you know, we at their web, our SDK has the best default options or settings. Uh, we also made it configurable and customizable so that, you know, every developers can bring in their own implementation and, you know, really just like solve the needs of the arts. Like, you know, you, you don't have to just like use whatever we decide. And we don't want to lock you in because that's not very web three. And we're gonna make sure that we keep that open for developer as well. Um, and you know, ultimately, what we care about is we want to shorten the time to production for developers while allowing the compatibility that is the ethos of Web three. And what's next? All the challenges and what we provide at Third Web. Um, I believe that you know we have spent the last eighteen months at Third Web laying down laying down the foundation of um, the, almost like a building block for, for Web3 so that builders don't have to. And obviously, you know, that is a statement that anyone can make. <laughs> and, you know, we don't want to just be another person to, to make that statement. And so we challenge ourselves. Um, you know, we, for us at Third Web, we talk about like, hey, we made it easier to build a Web3 game. What does that mean? You know, we spend three weeks, one person, to, uh, we managed to build a Web3 game called the Web3 Warriors using our gaming kit. And you can check it out, web3warriors.thirdweb.com. Um, it's a full one game on a blockchain. Uh, we deploy it on a base test net and really showcase and demonstrate, you know, what a Web3 game could be and built using our tools, right? Um, you would hear like Game Studio would spend years and months trying to figure out how to build a Web3 game, uh, but we managed to kind of do that in, you know, a short amount of time with one engineer. Commerce kit. When we think about like, hey, how can we make Web3 useful, right? Commerce is kind of one area where you could use it. Uh, you can use NFTs, you could use digital identity for commerce. And so we partner with Shopify to build Commerce Kit and really it's just to show like how you could build, um, you know, digital commerce experience um, leveraging Web3 technology. And obviously minting, everyone does it with their stuff. Um, what's next? I think in the last decade, we have seen that, you know, how compute, AWS, GCP, Azure, Cloudflare, um, they have unlocked a way for builder to build without having to worry, worry, worry about servers, right? And I believe that nobody, none of us here really are excited or passionate about racking servers and waking up at midnight, like dealing with like this failure and all of that, right? And cloud has made it so that we as a builder in the space um, really just like let our creativity run wild and let us build products that we wanted to build. The combination of better cloud infrastructure, the tooling, it frees builders up from dealing with all the burden of the infrastructure, the hardware, security, recovery, disaster recovery, all of that. And all of that led to, you know, the born of Web2 application that we've seen, right? Like social media, Snap, Instagram, um, all the application that we're familiar with, Twitter and all of that. And similarly, you know, we at Thera want to do the same for Web3. We want to empower developers to build decentralized internet product without having to worry about the infrastructure. Uh, we want to let you figure out what to build and then we will take care of the how part. And so anything that you want to build, uh, we can help. And what that means is, you know, you as a builder, uh, we want to free you up and let you be creative and innovate to build real use cases. What does Web3 social look like? What does Web3 broadcasting look like? What do brand needs? What do brands get out of it? Games, commerce, and more, right? The true innovations happen when builders is free from all of this burden of like the infrastructure problem and really focusing now on like what their user want and what application is useful for everyone. And that I believe will unlock, you know, will bring in more users in the space and really, really just like legitimize the industry as a whole, but also just like help people realize, you know, what a decentralized world could be. And that, I'll leave you with that. And if you're building Web3, uh, we'd love to chat. If you're a builder, you know, um, we'd love to help. Um, you can email us at partners at .com, or you can reach out to me, um, jake at thero.com as well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jake. Um, and really appreciate everyone for staying on extra. 
you should be getting a poll on your screen um, about giving us some feedback. So please take a moment to fill that out. And if you're going to be at ETHCC, we will hear the list of PLN events so far. Uh, please learn more and register at events.plnetwork.io. If your event is missing, you can also add it to the Google Sheet that was dropped into the chat. And that way we can get it added to the website. Thanks again, everyone. And yeah, also, if you have any additional feedback, we have a discussion hub in GitHub that we would love to get your more detailed thoughts on. This way we can continue to improve this meeting and make it something that is uh, useful and exciting and informative for everyone who is here. Um, so thank you again and have a great rest of your day.